So I asked Pastor Tom, so uh, what would you like me to share? You know, it's like, hey. He, he in essence said, well, the Bible. <laughs> Whatever God puts on your heart. And I was like, well, okay, that's real specific. So uh, we are going to look this morning at a message that uh, God has been stirring in my heart for some time. Uh, a message that I call keeping first things first. Uh, somebody might say that it's important to keep the main thing, main thing the main thing. We need to stay on target. We need to, to know what it is that, that uh, we're supposed to be doing. And, and I believe the Lord wants to remind us to keep first things first. I want to invite you to stand with me in reverence for the word of the Lord. We're going to read together Jude chapter 1 verse 3. For those of you not familiar with the book of Jude... It is one chapter long, so it, it's uh, it's not very long, but it's at the back of your Bible if you want to turn in your Bible to take some notes or underline this. Uh, Jude chapter 1, verse 3, uh, and I'm reading out of the ESD version, so let's read aloud together. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. May God bless the reading of his word. I'm going to invite my bride Susie to come and uh, pray for this morning's message. Uh, to pray for me, but to, uh, I think, more importantly, pray for you. That uh, you will have ears to hear, uh, not what I say. Uh, believe me, I can be loud enough, you'll hear me, okay? Even if you're sleeping, I will wake you up, okay? Uh, I know you may need an app. More importantly, may we be attuned to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit this morning, amen? Amen. Let's, uh, let's lift our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. And if you'd like, you can extend a hand um, to pray today. All righty. Lord, we come to you, and we are in awe that we can even do that. That we can even do that because of Christ and the way that has been made for us. And Lord, this is about this time right now. And Lord, we pray for the anointing of your spirit upon your servant. Um, Lord, that you would direct him and bless him and that his words would not be his own, but would be from you. And Lord, we also pray for our own hearts, our own ears. Um, our own thoughts, our minds, our spirits. God, that we would be open to hearing your word, not just hearing it, but Lord, that you would change us from the inside out because of your word. Amen. Lord, that you would help us to take these truths and apply these things to our, our lives, our actions, Lord, our thoughts, all of us. Lord, we dedicate ourselves to you this day. And we set this time aside as your servants to come into your presence and to hear from you. Thank you, Lord, in your mighty name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You can be seated. Jude wanted to write about our common salvation. The gospel. No matter who you are, no matter what your age is, we are all saved the same way. It's through the truth and the reality that Jesus, God of very God, became one of us, lived among us, so that we might understand and know who God is. Paul told the Colossians this way, He made the invisible God visible to us. He showed us who God is by how He lived His life. But more importantly, that He was willing to lay down His life, to die for our sins. But more than that, to be raised again, to, to come to life on the third day so that we too might live new lives. That we can go from being dead in our sins and transgressions to being alive in Christ Jesus. It's a common salvation that we all believe in Jesus and what he did for us. Jude wants to tell that story. But he says instead he found it necessary to write to encourage those first century believers to contend once and for all for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. God has been burning that in my heart for over a year now. 
It is my desire to communicate that reality that we today must contend for the faith that was given by Jesus. I was brought up in the assemblies of God. I know the 16 fundamental truths and, and uh, was taught them as a child, learned them in Bible college, and I have preached them. But I am not here today to contend for the doctrines of the assemblies of God. I'm not here today to contend for the doctrines that any man has set, put forth. I am here today to contend for the faith. The faith that was given by Jesus. The faith that he established. The faith that he has shown us. We need to know what we're contending for. It's easy for us to contend for all kinds of different things in our churches. I mean, look across just the community of Kent and we'll see a whole uh, litany of different denominations and faith that have come about because they're all contending for different things. And yet there is one faith, one gospel, one spirit. We need to know what we're contending for. And as we understand what we're contending for, then we are able to... Keep the first things first. What does it mean for you and me to be contenders? To contend for the faith. I have to, I have to pause for half a second and just tell you, this is probably like the 10th or 11th message that I have preached now from Jude chapter 1 verse 3, okay? This little letter at the end of our Bibles, right before the book of Revelation, only 25 verses long, and yet the reality is it is packed full of the reality of what we need to know today. Yes, yes. And, and we have to understand what it means to keep first things first. Now you can see, uh, and if you know me, I like to preach with acrostics. So F-I-R-S-T. What does it mean to keep first things first? Contenders for the faith are those who understand what it means to be fruitful, who are invested, who are relational, who are spirit-filled self-feeders, and who are transformational leaders. Now that is a mouthful. The reality is this could be a sermon series of five sermons or more. Okay? Uh, but Pastor Tom's coming back next week. And, and you know, I've got to give him the opportunity to, to share what God's speaking to him. He's our pastor. Uh, the reality for me is um, this could be a book of 10 or more chapters and probably will be someday. Um, there's so much there. But for you this morning, the reality is that this is a reminder. Look at your neighbor and say, this is a reminder. Is there anybody here today who's brave enough to raise your hand and say, this is your first time in church ever? This is the first sermon that you have ever heard preached? How many of you would raise your hand and say, this is probably like, you know, the 100th or more sermon that I've heard in my lifetime? Okay, that's most of us. So everything that I'm going to say today is not something that's new to you. Everything that I'm going to say today, you have heard in one way, shape, or form before. And so this is a reminder. And yet, living as a, command, living as a contender demands that we have a radical change in how we live as followers of Jesus. And if you look at our lives today compared to the lives of believers in the first century church, there's a radical difference. And it's because we've gotten away from the first faith. Watch out. We've gotten away from the first faith. We're not contending for those things that are first of importance. And so I want to ask you this morning as we begin, are you willing to contend for the faith that Jesus established? Or are you satisfied with the status quo? Oh, come on, sir. Are you satisfied with, with going to church? Are you satisfied with just being religious, a Christian? Our churches today are full. Uh, and I use that in uh, quotation marks. I mean, look around. We're not really all that full this morning. You go to many churches here in Kent or anywhere in our nation, but many of them are not that full. No, sir. Okay? There's lots of room in churches. And it's because we've gotten away from what Jesus established, and we need to contend for those things that are first. So the first part of contending for the faith means that we are going to be believers, followers of Jesus who are fruitful. Say fruitful. Jesus told us, and you've probably heard 
many messages preached from John chapter 15. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. nothing. You can do nothing. If we are in Jesus, then we are to bear much fruit. We should be fruitful as believers. There should be some fruit growing out of our lives. Some evidence. Say evidence. That's what fruit is. It's evidence that we are connected to the vine. That there is the life of Jesus within us. Because if, if we are separated from Him, if the life of Jesus is not in us, and we are just good religious Christians, then there's no life in us to be fruitful. And apart from Him, we can do nothing. Oh, we can put on a good show. We can, we can, we can do our religious routine. We can do lots of things in the energy of the flesh, but they are meaningless it is not fruit that will abide, fruit that will endure. Jesus talks about that in John 15. Fruitfulness involves two important things. If we're going to be fruitful, the first reality we have to understand is that fruit reproduces after its kind. You go back to the Genesis and God's work of creation as He created the the. the the plant life and the trees, each with the seed within them, they would reproduce after their kind. As he would, uh, on the sixth day, create all forms of living creatures and to ultimately create you and me as human beings, they reproduce according to their what? Their kind. We are not monkeys. Amen. Monkeys are monkeys, humans are humans. We reproduce after our kind. And Jesus explained it this way in a simple parable where he said, Each tree is known by its fruit, for figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. If you want grapes, you go out to the grapevine. If you want apples, you go into an apple orchard, to an apple tree. You know there's something wrong with the tree if you don't find the fruit that you're expecting there. All right. There should be evidence that you and I are followers of Jesus because Jesus elsewhere said that unless a seed of wheat goes into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces a harvest. What did Jesus do on the cross? He was a seed that went into the ground and died, but he raised again, and there's the evidence in his life in you and me. Life produces life. Life produces life. The life of Jesus in us should reproduce the life of Jesus in others. We should reproduce after our kind. How many of you say you're a disciple of Jesus? You're a follower of Jesus. Notice I didn't say Christian. I've gotten away from that because the reality is it's easy to be a Christian in America. That's a religious person. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a disciple of the Lord. The reality is that you and I as followers of Jesus, as his disciples, disciples should reproduce disciples. Who are you leading to Jesus? We should be bringing in other followers. Disciples should reproduce disciples. Pastors should reproduce pastors. Leaders should reproduce leaders. And churches should reproduce churches. Each reproduces after its kind. How much of the life of Jesus is really in you? The second reality that goes with being fruitful is that you cannot contradict yourself. If we are going to be fruitful and reproduce after our kind, the life of Jesus must be in us. And when the life of Jesus is in us, we are going to be obedient to God's word. We're going to be obedient to his commandments. We're going to live our lives like Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit is this. It is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
and self-control. Paul con concludes that saying that against these kind of things there is no law. Why is there no law? Why are there no commandments against being loving? Against being patient? You know, people will say, oh, don't pray for patience. You're going to come into all kinds of trouble. You don't want to be like Jesus? Notice it says the fruit, not the fruits. You don't get a choice. You either have the fruit of the Spirit being evident in your life, which includes patience, or you don't. Are you going to be fruitful? Will these things be in you? Because against them there is no law. What is their law against? The deeds of the flesh. You just back up in Galatians chapter 5 there. And what do you find? The works of the flesh are obvious. They are all kinds of immorality, sexual impurity, lust, covetousness, stealing, lying, dishonoring your parents. Are there laws against those kind of things? Amen. God had a lot to say. This is not how I want you to live your life. This is how I want you to live your life. We are to be those who have the evidence of his life in us by being fruitful with the fruit of the Spirit. Or as John the Baptist... <laughs> Told you I'd wake you up. As John the Baptist told a bunch of religious people, those Pharisees and Sadducees who came out to see if maybe he might be the Messiah, why is he preaching and baptizing, why are so many who wanted to see him... He looked at the religious people. So he would look at Christians today. And he would tell them, bear fruit in keeping with what? With repentance. We've, we've had this common salvation. We've come to Jesus and put our faith in him. We've repented. We've said, yes, I'm a sinner. You died for me. I deserve to die. Now keep fruit in bearing with your repentance that you have changed the direction of your life. Live your life. Obedient to the word of God, like Jesus, who did not come to abolish or do away with God's commandments and his law, but came to fulfill them, to live them out perfectly. Amen. If we have his life in us, then we too should be able to do that. I have to keep moving. If we are going to be contenders for the faith, then we are going to be people who are invested we are invested people. We are fully committed, fully giving of everything that we have. We're not holding anything back. Come on. We're all familiar with that ever popular verse. You'll probably see it on your TV screens referenced this afternoon if you watch a football game, John 3.16. It'll be right there somewhere around the goalpost. Many people may see John 3.16, but they don't really know what it says. And religious Christians don't really know what it means. Come on, come on. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Again, what did Paul say? Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus came to make God who is spirit known to us. God who is love. Love becomes tangible and understanding when you look at the life of Jesus and how he lived and gave himself completely to us. Jesus told a parable in Matthew's gospel as well as in Luke's. They're very similar, but I, but I like how Luke describes it. He called ten of his servants and he gave them ten uh, minors and said to them, engage in business until I come. That they each received the same. They each received from their master. You and I have received what I refer to as the T3, the TQ, that you notice it invested, that the T is Q. All of us have received an allotment of time, of talent, and of treasure. Time, talent, and treasure. And the master said, put this to work for me. Engage in business until I come. Or as the King James would say, occupy until I come. Okay. What are we doing with what Jesus has given to us? I have to be honest, I'm not, I'm not there yet. I, I recognize what is needed, but, but I'm not fully there yet. I still waste an awful lot of my time. I mean, you know, I enjoy sitting down with my wife in the evening and kind of cuddling on the couch and turning on the TV and, you know, just kind of zoning out and letting them tell me a story. With pictures and sound and all those wonderful lights and whistles that Hollywood can show us. 
How many of you are like me? Come on, come on, everybody should raise their hand because Paul said, no temptation has seized you but what is common to man. We waste our time when we could be praying, when we could be investing in another person. What are we doing with our talents, the, the abilities that we have been given? Uh, folks, there is no such thing as retirement in the kingdom of God. If there's still breath in your lungs, God has something for you to do. <laughs> Pastor Tom's not here this morning, and you all can ask me to leave when this is done, okay? I don't have to stick around, okay? All right? I was a pastor for, for 19 years in Garrettsville, and I was a pastor for four years in Toronto. And believe me, you got to be careful the things that you say to people in church on Sunday because they put their money in the offering plate, and that pays your paycheck. <laughs> now, I know God is my source, and I knew that when I was pastor, too. But you know what? It's, it's hard to stand up and, and actually say something that you think might offend somebody. What are, what are we doing? What, what are we doing with our gifts and abilities? Some of us think, well, Pastor Greg, you know, hey, I, I was involved in the church for years and years. It's time for the younger folks to do that. It, I, I put in my time. I'm just going to tell you all like it is this morning. Is that okay? Come on. Okay. Um, you all look around the building this morning and you see an awful lot of white hair. <laughs> or no hair. There aren't a whole lot of youngins in this church that you can give the job to. Hello. If you don't do it, who will? If you don't reach Kent State University, if you don't reach your neighbor, if you don't use the gifts and abilities that God has given you, nobody will. It's up to you. Because the day will come. Look at your neighbor and say, the day is coming. The day will come when you die and your seat is empty. What are you doing to fill it today? Your times, your talents, your treasure. We are Christians and we struggle to give our tithe. But Jesus isn't just interested in 10%. He wants it all. Yes, sir. Thank you, Lord. Every financial decision you make is a spiritual issue. I call them chocolate cream sticks choices. Boy, I'm getting off on a tangent. And I better <laughs> shut up because time's running fast. I call them chocolate cream stick choices because that chocolate cream stick that I want and will enjoy, it's temporal. I'm going to be looking for another one real soon because I'm going to be hungry. It doesn't endure. It only satisfies a want and not a need. Jesus said, I will meet all of your needs according to my riches in Christ Jesus. He did not say, I will meet all of your wants. We should be bringing off a lot of one stand in prayer. Yes, we do. Come on, sir. We, we are a long way from the first faith. We have an American faith. We have a Christian faith. We need to return to those things that Jesus established. What are you doing with what he's given to you? Are you fully invested with your teeth? The next thing is not only to be fruitful and invested, but those who are contenders for the faith will be relational. Uh, Americans today have superficial and artificial relationships. We, we connect on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all of these different social platforms. And yet, I, 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 I did meet you this morning. Was it Austin? Alex. Alex. I knew it started with an A. Uh, I, knew it was, I knew it started with an A. But that's an example of what, of what I mean. We, we met for the first time this morning, and, and I couldn't, I did my best to want to remember your name, but it, but it slipped through my fingers. How good are we at actually sitting down with each other over a cup of coffee or a dinner or, yes. or sharing with each other and talking face to face instead of just FaceTime on our phone or Facebook? We don't, we don't have authentic relationships. And it, you know what Alex needs is he needs those who will be authentic before him. 
and who will help him learn what it means to be an authentic follower of Jesus because he is a part of what I believe is Gen Last. There was a first generation that saw Jesus, that witnessed his miracles, that stood on the Mount of Olives and watched him ascend into heaven and there will be a generation that will see him return. I believe he's part of that generation that's Gen Last. Is he going to recognize Jesus when he returns? Or is, as Jesus said, when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? If there's going to be faith in Alex and those like him who are Gen Last, it's dependent upon you and me to mentor them, to come alongside and teach them how to walk in the faith and to be strong in prayer and to, to know what it is to understand the scriptures and apply it to their lives. We have to be authentic in relationship. See, because what Paul is talking about here in Romans chapter 12 is what uh, he and every Jewish person understood as covenant relationships. He said, we, though many, are one body in Christ and in individually we are members of each other. We belong to each other. We are in covenant. We talk about the new covenant and that we, we are partakers of what Jesus has done for us. But do you understand that if you are in covenant with God... That very nature of being in relationship with God has put you in an eternal relationship with everyone who calls on His name. Is it any wonder that Paul would tell believers in, in Ephesus that they should be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another as in Christ God forgave you? Yes. I got a little bit of history here at CLC. There's a lot of familiar faces in the room from 25 years ago. And in the 25 years since we went to pastor two different churches, there were lots of familiar faces and lots of people that we came to know and love. But can I be real blankly honest with you? Just like here, it happened in Garrettsville, it happened in Toronto, and it happens in every church that I know of. People who call on the name of Jesus get upset with a believer in the room, and sometimes it's the pastor. Watch out! And they go look someplace else yes, to yes, go to sir. church. Because they don't understand they're in covenant. But they're to have an unbroken relationship. Jesus said that by our love for one another, a watching world will understand and know that we are his disciples. It's time we get back to the beginning to try to understand what covenant is all about. Your marriage relationship is to be a covenant relationship until death we do part. Amen. Susie and I celebrated our 36th anniversary. It's like, how, you know, how did I get to be my dad and mom. You know, you know, we're dad and mom's age now. Like, how did that happen? How did you walk? But she is mine. I told her on the way down here. I said, I'm yours. I'm hers. She's mine. Until we draw our last breath or until Jesus comes. Amen. And yet divorce plagues our nation. It plagues the church. Amen. We don't understand what covenant is really all about. It's time for the church that there would be contenders for the faith. To understand the relational reality of being his followers. We're fruitful. We are invested. We're relational. And we are spirit-filled self-feeders. Paul said, be filled with the Spirit. Now, in the Assemblies of God, we get we, one of our 16 fundamental truths is that being filled with the Spirit means you speak in other tongues. Paul said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than y'all. He must have been from the south, southern Judea, okay? Um, but here in Ephesians chapter 5, you read what he says. He goes on and he describes being filled with the Spirit by being evident by the way that you speak. By the way that you begin to sing songs and hymns, you're making melody. There's joy within you because yes, you are filled yes. with the Spirit. Come on, come on. He, 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 he talks about submitting one to another. When was the last time that you, you, you heard somebody say, the evidence that you are filled with, with the Spirit is that you can submit to someone in authority over you? That, that if the ushers in the back of the room were to say, you know, we don't want you to sit over there. Or over there. We want you to sit over here. Would you put up a tussle that somebody asked you to not sit in your comfortable seat? I mean, I've been here enough. I know we all got our spots. Okay. Or would you be willing to submit? 
I don't know why he wants me to sit here, but but I'm going to do what he's asked. Amen. That's evidence of being filled with the Spirit. We need to be filled with the Spirit. And when we are filled with the Spirit, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will come and he will teach you about me. If we're going to get back to the first faith, we have to be willing to say, Holy Spirit, I don't know it all. My church doesn't know it all. Would you take those things that have been added to the faith? And would you take them away? Would you remove them? And Lord, if there are things in, in the faith that have been subtracted, taken away from the first faith, would you restore them? The Holy Spirit is in the business and he's in the work of doing those things. The Holy Spirit will declare Jesus to us. You see, it's time that we let Jesus define our doctrine instead of our doctrine define Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so when we are spirit-filled and we are in tune with the Holy Spirit, then he can take the word of God and he can speak to us and he can fill us. And you're not dependent on coming to church and suckling at the breast to hear and be nourished by the pastor every Sunday. Yes, yes. And starve the rest of the week. Come on, come on. Hebrews chapter uh, 5, verses 11 and 12. About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be leaders or teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. So many Christians today are just living on milk from Sunday to Sunday. They don't know what it is to hear the voice of the Spirit. They don't know what it is to, to actually read the Word of God for themselves and let the Holy Spirit speak to them and show them how to apply it to their lives. We need to be Spirit-filled self-feeders if we're going to contend for the first faith because that's how we grow up and are mature. And then finally, everybody says about time you got it. <laughs> we have to be transformational leaders Transformational leaders is a, is a relatively new term in the leadership field that, that describes leadership that is other-focused. It, it's not about the leader being first or best. It's not about the leader having absolute authority, but it's about the leader having an interest in those who are following. It's looking into the interests and what's best for others and helping them achieve some would call this servant leadership. Paul understood what being a transformational leader was all about. He gave this testimony in the book of Acts. He said, in all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul speaking with the Ephesian church, he, he knows that he is headed to Jerusalem, that when he gets there, he's been told prophetically that he will be arrested. It, I mean, he's coming down to the end of his life story. And he is telling these leaders, you need to continue to follow my example. I worked hard, but I didn't do it for myself. I didn't do it for myself when I was putting together tents, and I didn't do it for myself when I was preaching the gospel. I did it so that those who are weak might be made strong. That those who are weak might have their needs met. I was thinking about others. Because I knew the words of Jesus, and I want you to remember the words of Jesus, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. You remember Jesus' disciples, don't you? They all wanted to be disciple number one. They all wanted to be at Jesus' side. So much so that even on the night that Jesus was betrayed, as he broke bread and gave them the, the cup uh, to, to remember him and what he was about to do for them, that on that night there was an argument that had broken up amongst them as to who would be the greatest. And Jesus told them, remember, the greatest among you is not going to be the one who the world looks at and says, they got it all together, they've got all the money, they've got all the fame, they got all the knowledge, you can, you can bet that you want to be on their team. Jesus says, no, you are to be a transformational leader. 
you are to be a servant leader, that the greatest among you is going to become the least. And that those who are going to be first are going to be those who serve. That you look out for the interests of others. Jesus took a ragtag bunch of guys, of fishermen, of Levites, of tax collectors, of zealots. And he transformed them from the inside out so that they changed their world. Isn't it time that we became transformational? That we were... You might say, well, Pastor Greg, I'm not a leader. I'm just, all of us are leading somebody. If you are, how many of you are parents or grandparents? You're leading those children by your example. You need to do more than just pray for your kids to come back to Jesus. You need to lead them back to Jesus. You are the agent of change. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. Not in your own strength, not in your own ability, but powered by the Holy Spirit. So stop thinking about building yourself up. We're Americans. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Look out for number one. No. Stop trying to build yourself up. Begin to think of others and how you can build them I told you this morning that this message was a reminder that it was a message that uh, you probably heard preached many different times in many different ways. There's not a scripture that I've shared with you that you haven't heard preached before. But the reminder is also a warning. The reminder is also a warning. James talked about the reality that we cannot be just hearers of the word, but we must be doers of the word as well. That we have to apply it to our lives. And he went on in chapter 2 of his short letter and he described the reality that uh, some of us might have dead faith. That there is a difference between faith that is active and alive and faith that is dead. And some of you will know that God taught me the lesson the hard way that when you have something dead in you, you have to have it cut out back in January that uh, I had my gallbladder surgery. I was here with you folks on a Saturday and Sunday for, for uh, a weekend of ministry and uh, I ended up in the hospital and had to have my gallbladder out. The doctor told me when he, when he looked at my gallbladder, he said it was one of the worst that I've ever seen. I couldn't have the simple laparoscopic procedure, you know, where they just do a little cut here, a little cut here, a little cut there, blow you up with a, like a balloon and take it out. They tried that for an hour and it wouldn't work. He told me yours was one of the worst gallbladders I've ever seen. It was dead. It was stuck on everything around it. It had big abscess on the back. It was in bad shape. If I hadn't had it taken care of, that gallbladder would have killed me. But somebody who had knowledge and understanding went in and zipped me open, took it out. When we are living our life as religious people, as Christians, an awful lot of dead faith in the church. And dead faith looks to stick to anything that's alive. That's why we have to keep coming back to church. And that's why we depend upon the worship leader and worship him. Oh, if they sing the right songs, I'll get in touch with Jesus. I'm a pastor, that was a great message. I feel so... We stick to everything that's living. Because we're looking for life. And if there is dead faith in the church, if there is dead faith in our hearts, we have to come to the master surgeon Jesus and say, cut it out before it kills me. I don't need a faith that is in name only. I need to contend for the first faith that keeps first things first, that, that is looking to you, that I live my life radically different from American Christianity. I will surrender everything that I am. Like I said, I don't have it all together. I, 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 I'm praying, Lord, do a work in me. Change me. Yes. If he changes me, maybe he'll change my wife. Or maybe it's going to be the other way around. <laughs> we, we both need more of Jesus. I wish I could say we've arrived. But he's still working on me. You know, a, a verse that has meant the world to me from the time I was a teenager. With this, I'm going to close. It's 
It's Philippians 1 and verse 6. I remember being at an altar and my youth pastor coming and praying over me. I just said, we're confident that he will begin a good work in you. We'll be faithful to complete And for years, dare I say nearly a lifetime, I took that verse personally. Jesus is working on me. Christian under construction. And then the Holy Spirit, you know, he's my teacher, had me look at that verse and realize, you know what? Being confident that he who began a good work in you is not singular you. It's plural you. And he can't work in me unless I'm willing to be in relationship with other believers. To get connected. He works on me through you. He works on you through me, through others. Are we to the place where we can say, I'm tired of just religion, of just being a good Christian? And I want to contend for the faith, the first faith that Jesus established. And that by the power of the Holy Spirit that I believe and know is alive in me, he will put me with other believers who are like-minded, and together, together, we will contend to make first things first. Yeah. That we will be fruitful. That we will be invested we will be relational, that we will be spirit-filled self fears and that together we'll be transformational leaders that will impact our families, our neighborhoods, our community. It'll begin to look like the first century. As the worship team would come and lead us in a closing song, if you're here today and you're willing to say, yeah, Pastor Greg, I don't have it all together either, but I have heard what you said and I I want to surrender to Jesus. I want to take that first step of saying, Jesus, cut the dead faith out of me. <clears throat> my family is lost without you. My neighbors, my co-workers, my grandchildren, they are lost without you. And unless there is a change in me, unless there is a living faith in me, they have no hope. Thank you, Jesus, that you're not willing that any would perish. But that all would come to repentance. He's willing to do the work in us today if we're just willing to say yes. So even before they start singing, if, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you this morning that in one of these areas it touched a nerve and you said, yeah, that's me. I, I, I need to be transformed from the inside out. This is a place of prayer this morning. Susie and I would like nothing more than to just be able to come alongside and just pray for you that you would be transformed from the inside out, that dead faith would have no more part in us, that we would be alive again. It, 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 you know, I, I understand our American schedules. We have to go. We, we bless you in Jesus' name, whether it be work or a family event, whatever it is. If you can take a few moments this morning. Let's take some time to say, Jesus, this was for me. Do some open heart surgery on me today. I need to be made alive in Christ. Let's all stand as they begin to lead us. Let's find that place of prayer. Let's ask Him to transform us, to change us, to be contenders for the first faith.